Never take a sleeping pill called Somnidrill. You might never wake up again. Written by Priestess of Spiders on Reddit. Like and subscribe if you enjoy, and check out the original story down below. Now, without further ado, let's get started, shall we? I have always had horrible insomnia. Ever since I was a very young child, I would find myself tossing and turning at night, unable to fall asleep. It was a rare day when I woke up feeling even mostly well rested. I started taking melatonin and some other meds that could help me sleep at a fairly young age. They helped a bit, but people still commented on the near constant bags under my eyes. A little over a week ago, I stopped by the local grocery store after work, looking to get a fresh supply of sleeping pills to replace the ones I ran out of the night before. I went to the usual spot and just grabbed a bottle blindly. Not even looking at it, the cashier did not seem to look either, just scanned it and tossed it into a little plastic bag, which I would add to the already substantial pile which overflowed out of my trash can. It wasn't until late at night I actually took a look at the bottle, and I was angry. Sure, from a distance, it looked like the usual brand I got, but up close, it was markedly different. It looked like, uh, some cheap knockoff, deliberately designed to look similar to the name brand in order to trick the unwary buyer into buying it. The label on the bottle said Somnidrill, in crisp blue lettering, with no slogan, no chemical name, or anything else useful. I couldn't even find a company logo. I checked for the drug facts, hoping that at least it would have the same active ingredients as what I usually used. But no luck. All I could find on the back was a single sentence. Take one pill before bed. There was no way to tell what this drug was, and I groaned in frustration and fatigue. I figured I would try to get some rest without medicine tonight. I didn't want to risk it. I turned on my white noise machine, put on my eye mask, and tried to rest. As the minutes turned to hours, the bottle of Somnidrill on the bedside started to feel more and more appealing. Finally, at nearly 3 a.m., I gave in and opened the bottle. The pills inside were gel capsules filled with an opaque purple liquid. Without a second thought, I dry swallowed one and went back to bed. I started to try to count sheep in my head to tire myself. I got to 23 sheep before I lost consciousness. I suddenly found myself on hard concrete. I rubbed my eyes, standing up as best I could. When I opened them, I found I wasn't in my room. I stood on the edge of a tall building, looking over an enormous, brutalist city extending as far as I could see. Endless chaotic masses of angular grey buildings, surrounded by thick mist. I couldn't see the ground or the sky. Eventually, everything was so foggy, it was as if there was nothing there but buildings forever. Enormous spires of dark concrete extended for what seemed like miles into the sky, larger than any metropolitan building in the real world. There were no windows on any of the titanic structures, no lights to show I wasn't alone. The smell of the mold was heavy in the air, and I began to feel woozy. My eyelids fluttered as I started to lean towards the edge, about to fall. I woke up in bed, the faint sunlight pouring through my apartment window. It was about a minute before the alarm was due to go off. Normally when I dream about falling, I wake up in a cold sweat, panicked, 
part racing. This was different. I felt so energized, so utterly awake and ready to seize the day. Whatever this somni drill was, it was certainly working to fix my insomnia. The other employees at my cruddy minimum wage job were surprised to see how energized I was, and even my manager complimented me on my work. The endless parade of annoying customers seemed a little bit more bearable, less grating. I felt truly rested for the first time of my life. When it came to go to bed, I happily took another pill, genuinely looking forward to waking up well rested and focused. I counted how long it would take for me to lose consciousness. I got to exactly 23 seconds before I once again found myself in that strange, strange gray city. This time I was on a terrace, once again overlooking the impossible, endless metropolis. I turned away from the site, not wanting to fall like the last time. There was a doorway leading into the building, dimly illuminated despite there being no light source. I stepped inside, the slap of my bare feet echoing through the gloom and fog. The stench of decay and dampness increased as I walked through a maze of winding gray corridors, taking turns at random. Clusters of black mold dotted the walls with tendrils of the fungus extending off them like veins. As I approached another turn, I noticed the small pulsating black mass on the corner of the wall and ceiling. I touched it gingerly, and it erupted into a swarm of eight-legged bodies, scattering as the arachnids skittered away from the offending digit. Startled, I pulled away my hand and backed away with a gasp. Ah, just daddy long legs, I thought to myself. Gingerly avoiding stepping on the dozens of harvestmen, which were scamping, scampering across the floor, I continued onward. It felt like I had been walking forever, and I had no idea how long I had been there. I remembered stories of people who had dreams from which they felt like lasted years, how they awoke missing spouses they never married, children who were never born and I started to become afraid that I would never leave. As I started to panic, I started to hear something which pierced the unending silence of the dead city. A faint hum of static, like a whole white noise machine set to low volume. It reminded me of the gentle roar of ocean waves upon a distant shore. I began to move towards the noise, wanting to be free of the mon monotony of pointless exploration. I quickened my pace, jogging down the black corridor towards the static. As I rounded the corner at the end of the hallway, I caught a glimpse of something else. Something pale, moving around the corner. As it moved away from me, the static grew quieter. I started to take a step towards where the thing had left when I woke up. Once again, I felt rested and energized, but the dream lingered in my mind. It was much longer this time, and felt more vivid. Explaining away the dream lasted longer simply because I slept more than the night before. It was the weekend. So I decided to spend the day cleaning up my apartment and doing some long overdue chores. The energy I got from the sleep was stronger, more pure than anything caffeine could produce. I didn't need to touch an energy drink or a cup of coffee for the whole day. By the time I was done, the apartment looked cleaner than it had in years. I ordered something t for takeout for the night, a reward for a good day's work, before spending some time reading, something I usually didn't have the mental clarity to do. 
By the time I felt tired enough to head off to bed, it was nearly 12 a.m. I went into the bedroom and changed into my pajamas for bed. I looked over at the somnodrill on my nightstand. I knew I wouldn't be able to get to sleep without it, but I still felt trepidation. I remembered the previous dream quite strongly, more than I had any dream before. It felt so real, all five senses engaged. It had frightened me, but at the same time, it felt better than I ever had. I felt like the constant drowsiness which hung over my life like a fog was finally lifted, that I was free. Before I could change my mind, I popped one of the gel capsules in my mouth and swallowed, laying in bed and counting the seconds as I waited for sleep. Once again, exactly 23 seconds passed before I fell asleep. I was in a long, bare hallway, dimly illuminated before, despite there being no source of light, it seemed to continue onward in front of me into infinity. The same black mold grew in odd clumps on the walls, and I could see a twitching mass of daddy long legs near the ceiling. I turned around and saw the hallway continue on and on and on ad infinitum behind me as well. It seemed like the whole world had been replaced with these miles of concrete. In no particular hurry, I turned back around and started walking. I reflected on how quickly the transition from the waking world to the dream had been. It felt less as if I drifted off to sleep, and more as if I would suddenly been instantaneously transported into another place. It didn't feel like I was asleep. That sense of being guided along by the whims of my unconscious mind wasn't there. I was wholly lucid and entirely aware of my surroundings. I could feel the cold, slightly damp concrete beneath my bare feet. I could smell the scent of rot and stale air. I could hear the titness ringing in my ears due to the utter and complete silence, broken only by the stepping of feet as I marched endlessly onward. I tried to keep track of how long I had been there. But it is hard to tell time without a watch nor visible sky. It could have been hours, or merely twenty minutes. There was no way for me to tell. I didn't feel any hunger or thirst, so it could not have been too long. I started to feel hear the faintest hum of static coming from behind me. I turned around and squinted. I peering into the distance, straining my eyes to catch even a glimpse of the source of the noise. At first I didn't see anything at all, just an expanse of hallway, stretching on forever. But then I noticed a very slight hint of movement in the distance, something large and indistinct. So far away it was barely visible, but rapidly getting closer. I turned around and started running at full speed. I was glad I had saved my energy before, because now I needed to move as quickly as possible. I pushed myself as hard as I could, lungs burning from the effort, as I filled them with musty, stale air. I could hear the roaring static increase in volume behind me, but there seemed to be no end to this blank, featureless corridor. My muscles began to ache with the strain, my body begging me to just stop, lie down, and accept my fate. I was running on pure adrenaline, pushed on by the primal need to live, to survive. The once faint static was now almost unbearable in the intensity. It sounded like I was being pursued by a boombox blasting the sound of TV static at full volume. My ears felt as though they were going to burst from the intense noise. I shook my head and closed my eyes, trying to block out the dreadful cacophony. I then tripped. I sprawled out across the hard concrete, getting the briefest glimpse of my pursuer. 
an amorphous mass of gray cloth and outstretched pale arms covered with black veins of mold. Hundreds of harvestmen skittered on spidely legs through the holes of its voluminous robes and it glided towards me at a speed like a freight train. The unbearable roar of static ceased as I felt warm liquid dribble out my ears. A pale, long nailed hand grasped my leg and I screamed as I felt its touch burn my flesh. And then I was awake. Blood stained my pillow, dripping from my deafened ears. I fell out of bed screaming, but I couldn't hear my own cries. I attempted to stand up, but stumbled, my leg burning with intense pain. Gingerly, I rolled up my pant leg, revealing a white mark in the shape of a handprint. According to the doctors, both my eardrums had been severely ruptured. I should be able to recover in a few weeks if I make sure they don't get infected. They didn't even try to come up with a good explanation. According to them, I must have sleepwalked and jammed pencils in my ears. They couldn't explain the handprint either. It looked like frostbite, but there was no way I could have gotten it under the blanket of my heated room. They insisted that the handprint shape of the mark must be a simple coincidence. I managed to get a week off from work to recover, but I had to use up all of my sick days and remaining vacation hours to do it. It's been five days since the incident, and I haven't been able to sleep. I've tried everything, but no matter what, I just can't make myself lose consciousness. Without sleep, the brain starts to fail. Nobody knows exactly what will happen when it will outright kill you, but I must be getting close. I've begun hallucinating now, seeing little veins of black mold on my walls, daddy long legs climbing on the ceiling, and every so often I hear the faintest hint of static. I need to sleep. But I know now that the only way I'm going to get any rest is to go back to that horrible place. I have a glass of water and a pill of Somnidrill on my nightstand. Pray for me. I hope you enjoy. Please like and subscribe. It helps the channel a lot. See you next time. Hello there. How are you doing on this wonderful night? Today we'll be reading the story of Tin Can Sam. I hope you all enjoy. This was written by Eurytris on Reddit. Check them out. Now, without further ado, let's get started, shall we? Couch. I was a child of the late 80s, a time when kids played on the streets till the street lights came on and riding your bike through town was as normal as going to the corner store to buy your mom's smokes. In fact, the woods seemed to be the only place my dad specifically said was off limits. The woods seemed to be a boundary for many families and I never knew anyone who went there willingly. It's one of the few things that has stayed the same to this day, though so many other things have certainly changed since I was a kid. One prime example was the telephone. Coming from a small town, my telephone was on a party line, so if you wanted to talk to your friend, you went to his house and did it in person. I was fortunate in that respect. My best friend Davey lived right next door. If I ever wanted to ask him to play G.I. Joe or ride our bikes, 
I could just walk 20 paces rather than break out my huffy. Unless that was... We used... The tin can phone. The tin can phones were something we had cooked up after seeing it on a science TV show. The guy on the show had hooked up a pair of hit tin cans together with twine and showed that no matter how far off they went, you could still hear the other person with the other can. Davy and I had thought that this was just about the coolest thing we had ever seen, and we set about making them. I found a pair of old soup cans, and a long spool of mom's twine, and attached the ends to the cans. We could hear each other pretty well, a fact that surprised us to no end. But the farther away we got, the harder it became to hear each other. Let me show you a different way, Dad had said, startling us since we'd been so involved in our little project. He had linked the cans together with a length of fishing line, and the connection had been the next best thing to crystal clear. We used them a lot, linking our tree houses together with them, and we would talk into the night on them as we camped out in our different tree houses. It wasn't as clear as a telephone, but it was amazing, the conversations we could have had over such a simple little device. When Davy got grounded one summer, it became our only communication with each other too. Davy had gotten himself a little bit addicted to the new arcade that had taken up downtown. The laundromat that had been once been there had been cleaned out, but I could remember smelling detergent and fabric softener every time I went in to play a game of Pac-Man or Galaga. Davy and I went there a lot, but Davy seemed to have developed an unhealthy love of games. Any money he could scrape together was shoved into the arcade machines, and I remember noticing that he was absent from school in the middle of the day, and suspected he snuck off to the arcade. When the truancy officer brought him home around lunchtime one day, his parents finally decided that enough was enough. They grounded him for the summer, told him that... He might manage to earn some time back for good behavior, but forbade him to go to the arcade until he could get a handle on his addiction. Davy and I talked over the tin can when we could, but Davy made it pretty clear that his parents would take it if they found it. He would camp out when the weather was fair and talk most of the night, Davy's only real connection to the outside world being me. So when I picked up the can one night, calling for Davy through the hundred feet of fishing line, I was unsurprised to hear someone pick up right away. As it turns out, though, it wasn't who I was expecting. Hello? said a small voice, and not like Davy's at all. It sounded like an adult trying to do a bad imitation of a kid's voice. Who is this? It said again, and I remember shaking off my uncertainty, as I remember that Davy liked to do voices sometimes. Davy and I sometimes listen to the radio DJ's prank call people, or we'd catch comedy performances on the satellite TV Davy's family had. Davy had a few characters he had been working on. Despite the fact that they all just sounded like him, and I assumed that this was nothing more than another bad character performance. Who is this? I challenged back. This is Sam, the voice said, still high-pitched but getting a little surer of itself as the string made it sound tinier and robotic. But my friends called me Tin Can Sam. Yep, definitely a new voice. If it had been the modern day, I would have said that he reminded me of Herbert the Perfect from Family Guy. It was 1991, however, and all I could equate it to is that funny way that Michael Jackson talked. 
The voice was funny, kind of, but it also sounded like Davy doing a bit. Well, Sam, why do they call you Tin Can? Because I wear the tin cans. I empty like jewelry and clatter everywhere I go. I'm a hobo, you see, and most of my meals are taken from cans. Who do I have the pleasure of conversing with tonight? I played along and introduced myself to Tin Can Sam. He asked me if I went to school, and I told him that we were out for the summer. He asked if I lived around here, and I told him I lived next door. He asked me how old I was, and if I knew the kid who owned the treehouse, and a dozen other things as I played along. Some of you guys will think that this is weird. Why would I surrender a lot of information that Davy would have already had if he was already doing a bit? Well, to answer that question, you would have to understand how Davy was when he was doing a character. Davy was one of those people who would commit to a role, even if he was doing a new character. That person didn't know you. Interacting with him was like meeting Davy all over again. But he was my friend, so I put up with it. At least it wasn't Grandma Gerda who had memory problems and constantly forgot the things you told her. So I played along with the game, asking Sam what it was like to be a hobo. It's alright, I guess. I used to own a hardware store, but people didn't like me very much, so I had to leave. It's rough not having a house sometimes, but I meet so many interesting people on the road. What do you do for fun? I asked, nodding to myself at how thoroughly Davy had committed to the role. Tell stories, mostly. You sit around the fire at night and eat your dinner and tell tales. We especially liked scary stories. Scary stories? I asked, a little taken aback. Davy was not a fan of scary stories. He liked to try and play it cool, but he was a scaredy cat at the core of it all. When we watched scary movies together sometimes, he put the volume low so his parents didn't catch us. Davy always hid his eyes and sobbed sometimes when the killer got somebody. Sam liking scary stories was not something I was prepared for. Do you like scary stories? Sam asked, his voice sounding particularly hungry for the answer. Yeah, I said hesitantly. I like scary stories. I've got a really scary story, if you would like to hear it. I nodded before realizing that he wouldn't be able to see me and I told him that I did. I was still absolutely sure that this was Davy doing a bit, but the longer I listened, the less sure I became. The longer I listened, the more the voice sounded less like Davy and more like a stranger. Good, cause it's a really scary story. It's about these kids who were camping out in the woods one night. They didn't have a tree house like you but a tent instead. They had set up far from the town where they lived, and they camped at the site often. They came there for a sleepover one night, but they didn't know that there was an extra at their party this time. I sat on the fluffy orange rug I had taken after Mom was going to throw it out and felt my teeth trying to chatter. If this was a bit that Davy was doing, and it was better than usual. As the string brought his words to me, I remember feeling my spine shudder in the back. This was different. Way different. And I wasn't entirely sure I liked it. As I came up, they heard me. They looked out to see what was making so much noise, peeking from the zipper as they looked into the once inviting wood. It was dark through the woods, and the woods were dense as I moved about, rattling and shaking. They kept looking around anxiously, trying to figure out where I was. The more I moved, the more scared they became. 
They thought I was a ghost. Some sort of spook. And the longer I rattled, the more they shivered. It was windy that night, and I seemed to be everywhere. Okay, Davy. I said, my voice shaking a little as I watched the fire on my lantern dance. I don't like this game anymore. Who's Davy? The voice asked. I told you my name was Tin Can Sam. Now, where was I? I looked out the windows, trying to see into Davy's treehouse. But the branches of the big oak his dad had built obscured the structure. All I could see was the string as it hung taut between us. Oh, that's right. I could hear them whispering over there, discussing their chances if they ran. They didn't think they stood a chance if they stayed, but if they ran, well, they believed I could only catch one of them. They were arguing, starting to yell, and they got louder and louder. I crept up on their tent. I'd have them then and there. But suddenly, they burst out of the tent and ran in every direction. I smiled as they ran, knowing I could easily catch more than one of them. Stop it, Davy! I yelled. The story creeping me out when, coupled with the voice that told it, I don't want to hear it anymore. Despite this, I felt unable to take the can from my ear. I caught them. I caught them. I sliced them and diced them. I cut their throats and sliced out their tongues. I cut their legs and took off their fingers. And when I turned my attention to the third boy, I knew I could get him before he got home. I took off after him, my cans rattling like ghostly chains. He kept glancing behind him, hearing my clatter as I got closer and closer. His feet slapped against the ground, and if he'd hit a single root, we wouldn't be having this conversation. I was so close, my knife still wet with his friend's blood. And as I lunged, he jumped over a small fence and came into his backyard. I stood, watching as he tripped and rolled onto the grass of his home. And when he looked back, I melted into the woods. His race won. I let the can fall to the rug, not wanting to hear anything else. As I scrambled to the ladder of my treehouse and pulled it up, unlike the children in the story, I was not in a tent. I knew that no one could get me if the ladder was up, and as I dragged it into the treehouse, I could see a shadow as it hunkered at the edge of the fence, separating my yard from Davy's. It was a man, a skinny wisp of a man with strings of cans hanging off of him. He looked up at me as I looked down at him, and even in the dark I could see his broad white teeth as he grinned. I slammed the trapdoor shut, but even in my safe fortress I wasn't outside his reach. As I hunkered on the carpet, I heard his voice ooze from the can as he left one final word on the map. Tell your father he was right to tell you to be cautious of the woods. <laughs> he may have said more, but I threw the can out the window and heard it tonk as it landed in Davy's yard. I spent the rest of the night with my knees against my chest, jumping at every sound outside as I listened to the clank of cans. I didn't come out when the sun came up. And when someone called my name from the ground, I jumped in surprise. Looking out my window, I was happy to see it was my dad. I came down the ladder, leaping into his arms as I cried against his shoulder. 
What's wrong, kiddo? Have a bad night? He asked, smiling, but clearly concerned. I felt him stiffen when I told him what Tim Can Sam had said, and I felt him hug me even tighter. I'm sorry, kid, he said. I am so sorry. I never slept in that treehouse again, and after I told Davy about what had happened, I don't think he did either. I'm an adult now, obviously, and my parents' house is now my house. After my dad died of a stroke when I was in college, and mom passed a few years later. Melinda and I decided to move into the largest part of my inheritance. Our children love the big backyard. The treehouse that I've refurbished and repaired, but I always warn them to stay out of the woods. They always beg to be allowed to explore, but I've put my foot down where the woods are concerned. I've never seen Tin Can Sam again. But if I ever think that maybe I imagined it, all I have to do is listen carefully on quiet nights. Sometimes, if you listen closely, you can still hear the clank and jangle of old cans as they blow in the breeze. I hope you enjoyed. Please like and subscribe, it helps the channel a lot. See you next time. Hello there everyone, welcome to my humble abode. I hope you all doing well today. Today we will be reading... Decay. A creepypasta. Link to the original story will be in the description below. Please do like and subscribe. And without further ado, let's get started. Am I going to die? The kid asked me as he was being rolled into the operating theater. It was a question I'd heard a thousand times before, but answering it truthfully hadn't become any easier. Even after years at the hospital. Of course not. We are going to fix you right up. I lied. He'd been crushed in a horrific car accident, and though we would put all our effort into saving his life, Hope was a limited resource. The fact that he even remained conscious despite losing most of his blood was bizarre enough. But after ten years on the job, nothing surprised me anymore. The anesthesiologist quickly put him under while we scrubbed in for surgery. Damien would be the surgeon. A specialist in polytrauma cases, and I would assist. No sooner than we opened him up before we shared a look of disappointment. There was no chance in hell he'd survive through surgery. Despite our lack of faith, we tried our best. But after only half an hour on the table, his heart gave out. How was he still alive when he arrived? Damien asked. He pronounced the time of death and left us to clean up the mess. I took the responsibility of cleaning the kid up for the morgue, a task I had committed to a thousand times before. It wasn't something I personally enjoyed, but to me it was my final chance to pay respect to the dead. The kid couldn't have been more than 15, and as I heard, he was just learning to drive, unexperienced and attempting his first drive on a slippery road. He managed to steer off into a ditch. His father died on impact, but he himself lived long enough to face surgery. As I put the needle to his open abdomen, his body twitched for a moment. I retracted the needle in surprise, 
wondering what has caused a post-mortem spasm. Then the boy suddenly gasped for air as his eyes shut open. He let out the most violent scream imaginable as he suddenly returned to life. Help me, he, uh, he begged with a guttural voice as I stumbled back in panic and slipped on the floor. I called for help and the rest of the team came running into the operating theater, each panicking as they witnessed the dead boy scream on the operating table. His spine was fractures, so though he yelled in agony, he could do nothing to move. The anesthesiologist quickly attempted to sedate him while we checked his vitals. Despite all evidence pointing to the contrary, his heart had not started beating again. He was supposed to be dead. I started chest compressions, desperately trying to get his heart going. I cringed to the sound of ribs cracking beneath my hands, and the boy's screams turned to gargles as he was unable to gasp for another breath. He's not going under, the anesthesiologist yelled, as he gave the kid a second dose of propofol, of course without a functioning heart. There'd be no way for the drug to flow through his veins, even as I tried my best to pump for him. After an hour of compressions, the chief of surgery had intervened and ordered us to stop. At that point, we caused more damage than we helped. What? What's happening to me? The kid stuttered, still conscious. None of us responded. We couldn't find any words to describe the horrific sight before us. Most of the staff had left due to the sight. We'd faced many challenges in our career, but nothing quite like this. What's your name? I asked, despite already having seen in the file. I just wanted him to focus. Brian Dawson, he responded. I took a deep breath, doing my best to keep my composure. You were in an accident, Brian. I told him. His eyes darted frantically around the room as he started to realize where he was. He tried to lift his neck, but due to the spinal fracture, he was completely paralyzed. I can't move. I, I, I can't move. He cried. I walked closer, standing directly above him. Brian, your heart isn't beating, I said. The chief of surgery, George, grabbed me by my shoulder and whispered in my ear. We need to isolate the OR. Whatever's happening here is beyond us and could be contagious, George said. He rushed into the preparation room, picked up the phone through the glass window. I couldn't hear what he said, but I assumed he was calling security to shut down the ward. What about my father? Brian asked, trying to hold back tears. I was taken aback by his question. I had just told him his heart was destroyed and that was he was essentially dead. Yet his first concern was regarding his father. I'm sorry, Brian. He died on impact. He sobbed quietly. So, so what's going to happen to me? I'm going to die, aren't I? He asked. I didn't know what to say. I'd never been in an, a similar situation, so I gave the only answer I thought might be of some comfort. You're not alone. I'm staying here until the end. George had been quick to shut down the operating theater, and the Center for Disease Control had long since been alerted to our situation. We had nothing to do but wait and pray to God that Brian wasn't contagious. I had already been exposed, so I examined Brian, checking for any chance of improving his situation. Can you feel this? I asked as I checked all his limbs. Not a thing, he responded, 
but it hurts so, so much on the inside. Where exactly does it hurt? Everywhere. Please do something. He begged. I gave Brian a dose of fentanyl, but without a heartbeat to move the drug around. I had little hope it would take any effect at all. To keep him distracted from the pain, I asked mundane things about life. What his hobbies were, family stuff. He was smart enough to realize my intentions, but went along with it. Either out of fear, or because he actually hoped someone could save him. Hours passed while we waited for someone to tell us what to do. Half the surgical staff had been put in quarantine, terrified that they might be infected. Finally, the CDC arrived on scene, fully geared in hazmat suits. They allowed us to roll Brian into his own space. A pre-operation room had been evacuated, so he could stay somewhat comfortable. The rest of us would be put into the surgical office while the situation was being assessed. I decided to stay back with Brian. No one should have to suffer alone, especially with CDC agents probing him with all sorts of needles, enthusiastically taking samples. The only reason they allowed me to stay was because I kept him relatively calm. We talked about the night. After the procedures were finished, I couldn't sleep. And I doubt Brian was physically capable of it. My, my eyes feel a bit weird, he said. Do they hurt? No, the edges are just kind of blurry. It's weird. I left to talk to George, who was working around the clock, calling around, making sure the other patients were redirected elsewhere. What if we put the kid on a hot lung machine, I asked. George put the phone down for a moment and sighed. Then what? He has no functioning liver. His aorta is cut into pieces, and his intestines shredded. Even if we got him a new heart, he'd never survive, George responded. Just keep him company while you can. I knew he was right, but some of my professional knowledge was put aside due to the insane nature of the situation. Doctor! Brian shouted. I rushed to his side. I, I can't see, he stuttered. I pulled out a flashlight and examined his eyes. Both pupils were unresponsive, and his eyes had started to almost deflate, which was one of the stages of decomposition. Brian had started to rot. Please, I'm so scared. Brian was a brave kid, but he started to lose his composure, just like everyone else in the ward. I kept talking to him, but the inevitable truth was that if he kept decomposing, he'd soon lose all his senses, all while being conscious to experience it, as horrible as it might sound. I begged that I might finally allow him to pass on. We kept talking. I asked him if there was anyone he wanted to call. But as I already knew from the others, Brian's mother had died during childbirth, and his father had been in the same accident as himself. As we talked, Brian's voice kept getting louder, as if he was still struggling to hear. Are you hearing me alright? I asked. What did you say? Brian basically yelled. His hearing had deteriorated within minutes, going from impaired to deafness before I could even begin to help. With him being blind and deaf, we no longer had a way of communicating, no matter my attempts. I couldn't comfort the dying kid, and the CDC quickly decided that my presence had become unnecessary. Brian kept screaming in terror and agony as I left. For each passing second, his own body started digesting itself, and nothing we could do would take the pain away. 
by the morning, the screams had silenced. I barged into the room, much to the dismay of the agents. Brian was hooked up to hundreds of cables, monitoring his heartbeat, brain, muscles, and vital values. Of course, his heart showed no activity, and the decay had progressed to shut down all his muscles. He had quieted down, not because the campaign was gone, but because he wasn't able to scream anymore. The only part of his body still working was his brain. What the hell happened, I asked. Get him out of here, one of the men demanded. The other man complied, but went outside with me to explain the situation. You don't have to worry about it being contagious. We'll lift the quarantine in a moment, he said. He looked weirdly somber as he spoke those words. What about Brian? What will happen to him? He's still conscious, but he has no respiratory function anymore, so we have no means of communicating. Brian was still alive, blind, deaf, and dumb. He had to suffer in loneliness, unable to die. How long did he have to suffer for? I asked. We'll know more when we move him to our specialized facility. The senior CDC agent demanded that his colleague kept quiet before they could tell me anything else. They left with Brian, covered him within an airtight capsule, so no one would see the horrors that just occurred within our surgical ward. As soon as the quarantine was lifted, I headed home to write up my letter of resignation. I had a well-connected contact within the CDC, but upon trying to get more information, he claimed no such case had ever been presented to them, that no one had ever been admitted to their facility under the name of Brian Dawson. About a month later, accompanied by a doctor, showed up at my door with a bunch of documents, all regarding doctor-patient confidentiality. The lawyer looked tired, worked down to the bone, and as if he'd made many such trips before, he asked me to sign the documents and never speak of this again, saying I'd lose my medical license if I did. Not have mattered to me, I'm done in that field for good. I was given an injection by the doctor. He told me that Brian's disease was not unfamiliar to them and that it was extremely contagious, but only upon death. He explained that half the population is infected with a disease that keeps the brain conscious for hours, even days, following death. Brian's case was special in the sense that he he actually retained some motor function and was able to speak to us. The injection given was not a cure. It only prevent me from spreading the disease. But once I die, I'll suffer a fate similar to Brian's. I just hope someone will stay with me when it happens. And that is the horror story, thus titled decay. I hope you enjoyed. Please like and subscribe. It might keep the monsters at bay. <laughs> <laughs>story thus titled Elysium what will it be about what horrors will it bring stick around if you want to find out and if you end up enjoying the video please like and subscribe without further ado let's get started I remember living on the streets that I remember. Exactly how that came to be is still unclear. But I know that one way or another it was because of my parents. I hated them. Hate them with the little memory of them I have left. Flashes of pure terror. 
Like being beaten bloody on my sixth birthday. And being trapped in a closet for weeks at a time with little interaction and even less food. This is how I remember life with my parents. The only food I ever got was dog chow. Tuna meant for cats if I tried to be bold. I don't remember if it was a pet or a sibling, but there was something that they loved more than me. Something that always got all the attention. What it was doesn't matter now. I've seen horror all my life. I lived on the streets for a while. I think it came up two years ago, but it could have been more. It felt like a lifetime. Sleeping on playgrounds and benches. Stealing or eating out of trash bags just to survive. I was about 11 when Alice picked me up. She found me cradled in the fetal position behind a dumpster between two buildings, the names of which I couldn't read. I was just skin and bone back then. She said I had blood on me, but whether or not it was mine, I still don't remember. I was in shock from something. That's when I met her. When Alice took me in, she promised a new way of life. She promised a family love and nurturing, but most of all she promised food, real food. She took me to her car and drove me up to the manor where she lived. I do remember that she didn't actually drive. We sat in the back of a long black car with slick red interior leather as an old man wearing a little hat drove me to my new home. The building reminded me of a haunted mansion I saw in a movie once when I snuck into the theater. I've never eaten so much popcorn before in my life. <laughs> People just left it all over the floor and nobody else was trying to get it. I don't remember what the movie was, but it made me not want to go back into that building. I screamed, I cried. I punched the driver in the eye, but through the soothing mystique of Alice's welcoming voice, I was coaxed inside. Whilst under the spell of a sweet voice and intoxicating aroma of love and flowers, Alice took me by the hand and walked me into the tall building that towered before us. Once inside, she introduced me to the four others she was living with. Five, I guess. There was Wilbur, a lanky teen with sandy blonde hair. His girlfriend, Mary, who was about ten years his senior, with her beautiful brown eyes, and vibrant rose lips, Jeremiah, who was about my age at the time but seemed to be so much older. And Junk. Junk was only a little younger than Alice, who must have been in her twenties at the time. Junk was skittish, but they were all very kind to me, and they all wore suits. The girls had skirts coming off their suits, with solid black leggings. Everybody had soft black suits with white gray undershirts and ties that varied from shades of purple and blue. They welcomed me in a spectacular ceremony and explained that I just entered a magical place, which they called Elysium. The fifth body was of a man climbing 30 years or more named Jack. He didn't appear until after the welcoming ceremony. Everybody mostly referred to Jack as Sir or Father. His suit was the smoothest shade of black and he wore shiny gold cufflinks. His undershirt was dark purple and his tie was red. His hair was black and well gelled. 
The streaks of white and silver at the side of his head did not appear as an ancient feature, but as magnificent and distinguished. His emerald green eyes were like portals to another world. I felt as though I knew everything when I looked into them. I thought I felt that way because he had so much raw power. One could absorb some simply by looking into his eyes. He was an eccentric being, always making a spectacle when entering a room. Even when he remained silent, his presence was heavy and enlightening. His presence was that of a god. Even if you were blindfolded when Jack stood in the same room as you, you would know. You could feel him. Watching. Breathing. Reading your mind. You could always feel him. My name was Kevin when I first arrived, but Jack dubbed me Abel. He named everyone and he thought of everybody as his children. He called us his children. Jack took each of us from desperate times. Wilbur worked at his father's surf shop somewhere far, far away. But he also worked at his father's drug trade. If Wilbur ever disobeyed his father, he would beat him and inject him full of something called heroin. This was apparently a means of keeping Wilbur from leaving, as his father's was the only place where he could get more of it. Wilbur said, after having heroin once, you needed it all the time. Junk also lived a fair life of abuse. Jack found him after his principal had dumped him in a ditch and left him there for dead. Apparently, wherever it was that he attended, the entire school hated him, students and staff alike. They would call him junk, so Jack told him to turn that weakness into a strength. And he made that his new name. It never quite had the effect Jack was hoping for. Or maybe it did. Wilbur and Junk were the only ones who dared to tell me about their lives before Jack. Speaking of a time before Jack was strictly prohibited because we didn't need anything else. Jack had been the only one to ever care about us. Nobody else would, and this is something he would remind us often. He told me once that he was to make sure we were never ungrateful. The whole house was my family, but Wilbur and Junk were my friends, my best friends, my brothers. Though Jer Jeremiah and I did have our share of heart to hearts, and I'm pretty sure he wanted my head on a spike. I knew he'd have my back. He was my brother after all, and he would protect me, but maybe it was because he wanted him to be the only one allowed to hurt me, he and Jack. Jack and the others taught me that Elysium was a holy place, untouchable by those unworthy. They said that those with truly dark hearts are nothing when they looked up at the building or the property on which it stood. That to them, it simply was not here. I had heard vague descriptions of heaven in the past, which Jack said was close to Elysium, but not quite. Elysium was a place where lost souls could go, with their hearts still beating. A paradise for the broken, if you will. And once you die, your soul remains there. It simply traveled to a parallel plane of existence, invisible not only to wicked hearts, but anything that drew breath. However, Jack wasn't like us. He said he stood in both planes, that when we died and shifted to the next, he would greet us as the same spirit 
he's always been, but in a completely different form. He told us that our own appearances would be changed forever, details depending on the wavelengths of one's soul. We would take on our true forms. Jack's ability to see and exist in both planes explained why he would sometimes speak as if in a conversation with someone, despite us seeing nothing. Even when Jack thought none of us were around, this was him talking to those on the other side, in forms incomprehensible to those on the outer plane. Within my first week of living in Elysium, Jack professed to me that if he were capable of having favorites, I would be it. He said that he saw a lot of potential in me. Jer overheard this and never truly got over it. Jack had to be stern with me sometimes, beating me with his cane or taking me to the dark chamber. But compared to everyone else, I was always the golden child. I almost never stepped out of line. So I didn't really have the same experience as at Elysium as everyone else. Apparently whenever Jack thought someone broke a very serious rule or too many rules, he would come for you when you were alone and perform some mysterious act of horror upon you. Jack slept with everyone in Elysium as a way to bring our souls closer together. It was a horrifying thing to experience, every second of it terrible. But even so, they said this was not the mysterious punishment, nor was it the visits to the dark chamber. But as far as I was concerned, those were the two worst experiences to have in the house. It bewildered me to think that there was something even worse than the tortures that met you in the dark chamber. And to this day, I still don't have any details, or even a vague idea of the mysterious act. Whatever it was, it was sometimes made people to want to leave, but they didn't. We all stayed because there was nowhere else to go. No one else to go to. Jack was all there was. He was our God. Our home in heaven. Months after she disobeyed and experienced this mysterious horror, Alice told me something that nobody else had shared before. Because it was prohibited. She told me her name before Jack. It was Donna. Her friends used to call her Don or Donnie. She said sometimes she missed that name. She felt that when Jack changed her name, he changed who she was. And sometimes she didn't like that person. Not at all. Overall, Jack was kind to us. He took care of us. He fed us. We all ate together, we read together, and we bathed together every week. We were a family. We never left Elysium. The property was rather large, so we still went outside, but we never truly left. The only people who could leave the house were Jack and his butlers. Alice used to go out, in charge of finding new members. But one day, something happened, and that changed. Jack J gave the job to Mary, but after a week, he simply kept the duty to himself. He even stopped taking the butler, saying he could trust few. Over the years, a few more children were added, and it was great. Our family was growing. But when I was about 16, it seemed as though Jack was letting anybody with a shady past into our doors. There was no great selection, no light. He saw in them as he saw in me. He was simply recruiting. We started having larger ceremonies where Jack would explain how we were to live our lives in Elysium 
and how evil and wretched the outside world was. How he was all we had and all we needed. I hated many of the new children. The ones let in because they had a shady past and a beating heart. They had no morals, no respect, no love. They would pick small groups and remain in them. They would ridicule anyone who wasn't a part of them. We were supposed to be a family. Siblings. As though we shared blood, but that was no longer the case. Amari and Adriel were the worst of the bunch, the ringleaders of all the bad apples that had corrupted Elysium's holy basket. It was like they thought they were Jack. They looked like they were identical twins, even though Amari was a boy and Adriel a she-devil. But they were also lovers. Years ago, that would have disgusted me. But things like that became regular practice in Elysium. I was about 20 to 23 when we reached 40 or so members. I believe just below 40. I don't know how many, exactly how old I was. Because that's something we don't keep track of in Elysium. You are not to keep track of days, years, or months. You can recognize the seasons, but you cannot count them. Jack said this was because Elysium was eternity, and to try to know one's age was to deny and reject that eternity. But Alice had gifted me a calendar to hide. I would mark it almost every two moons, and we should try to celebrate my birthday when we had the chance. I was eternally grateful for this. I've always loved numbers, but I've never been able to count very high. When Jack found the calendar, Alice took the fall. It had trucks on it. February was a fire truck. I never saw Alice after that. I guess she disobeyed Jack one too many times and was sent off to Garnish. Garnish was where disloyal members went, those who were not worthy to bathe in Elysium's holy energy. Where this was, I didn't know, but nobody ever came back from Garnish, ever. I loved Alice. She was like a mother to me, or an elder sister. I had many siblings, and I had my group of friends, but with Alice it was different. I'd always call her Donna in private, and she'd always call me Kevin in private. She was the only one. I loved Donna so much, but I always thought that Alice sounded prettier. Things were never the same after Jack sent Alice away, and with the new members I ever hardly saw Jack. Sure, I would see him speaking during ceremonies or sometimes during mealtime. But never one-on-one. -on -one. He still called us his children, but it didn't feel that way anymore. No. Things were different. I was different. I was growing tired of Jack ruling over Elysium. He didn't care about us anymore. I knew he didn't. I was tired of living in Elysium. I've always been told that the world outside was where the devil ruled and my few memories of childhood definitely supported that, but so what? Who's to say Jack was not the devil? Could God and Satan not be one and the same? He who could exist on two planes was surely capable of wearing more than one face. The cleansing began when Amara spoke ill of Alice. I thought I'd heard it before, but it was always in a crowded area, so I could never be sure. This time, it was in the quiet hall just before our chambers. He called me scum, and said that Alice was a whore who strayed from Jack's path and deserved to suffer in Ganesh. I grabbed a fistful of hair and crashed the blonde fool's head over the hall window. 
Noise didn't matter. Nobody was to leave their chambers at this light. Only Jack could, and his chambers were on the other side of Elysium. I grabbed a shard of glass and cut his throat. He gurgled at me with teary eyes, and I prayed to Alice. I remember in the beginning I was very keen on covering my trails. I didn't want to know how such an act would be treated by Jack, or the other members for that matter. Order was lost. These new members were clear agents of chaos. I used to think that such fools didn't deserve to bask in Elysium. But as I went on with the cleansing, I wondered if Elysium had not been garnish all along. I soaked up the blood with the sheets and threw them in the furnace. I could not throw Morris in along with them because not only was I unsure if it would completely burn his bones or not, regular maintenance of the furnace was kept, and somebody would be checking up on it just before the day rise. So I wrapped Amaris in more sheets. We had so many. Jack said it was in preparation for a growing family, and placed him outside in Elysium's court. One thing Jack teaches you is how to be one with the animals. I called a bird to my hand and broke its neck. I threw it up into the windows I'd broken with a Marie and carried on. I got a shovel from the green room and dragged a Marie to the woods. I dug for many breaths, of which I lost count and buried the bastard under the dirt. I'd cut my hand on the piece of glass I used on Amaris. It bled and screamed agony as I dug and I buried. But Jack had taught me that pain was the only in the mind. I was on a mission and I had to carry it out. While walking through the woods, I spotted a stick protruding from the earth. I found the stick curious because it was bright orange. How strange, I thought, so I dug the area around the orange stick, unsure of what I would find. What I did find was a woman, decaying with worms and maggots, wriggling around in the remains of her flesh. I gifted Alice a green tie once. I found it while wandering in the field. I liked the color green and I thought she deserved some individuality. This upset Jack, of course, but at the same time, he was still partial to me and let it slide. This woman had on that tie, as I'm sure you've guessed. The woman I found was Alice. I did some more walking and found a rather large area littered with orange sticks. I had found Garnish. I had to ditch my bloodied suit walking back to Elysium in nothing but my shoes and my briefs. Of course I had extra suits, but only so many. I prayed Jack would not count them, because I couldn't think of a good reason why one should be missing. When night became day, I helped the butlers clean up the glass and used one of the shots to reopen the wound on my hand, so it wouldn't seem suspicious. Nobody thought the better of it. Nobody but Adriel. Many assume Amari had simply abandoned Elysium, and Jack saw him dishonored. He even held a ceremony about it, but she was not convinced. In fact, his disappearance drove her mad. She would not shut up about foul play, not until Jack ordered her to. Adriel became a silent being after that. Despite this fact, I decided she was next. She got on my nerves, and though she seemed innocent now, I knew she was still pulling the strings on Elysium's bad apples. 
I have never heard whispers of a mutiny. If anybody was going to take that bastard, Jack, down, it was going to be me. But first, I had to destroy what he created. The story of Adriel's demise isn't really one of much, much interest. She was in the green room and I beat her to death with a hammer. Simple as that, I didn't even say anything. Didn't feel anything either. Not even rage, it was just a minor chord. The only interesting and rightworthy things about it were some memories flooded back during the act. I'm still unsure exactly what brought me to the streets as a child. But I do remember what happened to my mother. My mo father started having me make his meals. I made him four dishes before I doused one with rat poison. When my mother caught me with the box of poison in one hand and my father's plate in the other, she threatened my life. Instinctively, I reached for the closest object on the counter behind me and I beat her head in with a meat tenderizer mallet. Just as I beat Adriel. I know it's not very interesting, I've never been a good storyteller. But it was nice to have at least one happy memory from my childhood. From Kevin's childhood, I should say. The cleansing couldn't wait after that. I didn't want a slow process, I wanted blood and death. I decided I would simply burn the building to the ground with everyone inside. But before I could do so, I still had a few chores. My intent was to tear down everything Jack had created. That included my family and my friends. I decided I would go to junk first. Jer and Wilbur got stronger than we had first met, but Junk never really changed that much. I knew physically he would be the easiest. My friends deserved more than just burn away in that place. They deserved something better, closer, more personal. I did love them, I really did. Junk often liked to prepare the family's meals, so I offered to help him. It did occur to me that I could poison the children of Elysium as I tried with my father, but that would taint my final moment with Junk. He was always a dear friend to me, and I loved him like a brother, a real brother. He snuck out with me that night so we could watch the stars, a favorite pastime that we hadn't done in quite a while. I guess things just got too busy for the both of us with all the new members. We sat together on the grass, just staring at the night sky. I asked him if he knew how much he meant to me. He didn't know the extent, so I told him. We cried. He stood up to give me a proper hug. I held him tight, as if the breeze would blow him away. I retrieved the discreet kitchen knife I swiped earlier that day and drove it into his back. His last word was a whisper. He asked me, why? I looked at him for a second and put my hand over his shoulder, unable to answer. I wanted the embrace to last, but I knew it couldn't. I drove the blade in further and it gave a twist. He fell to my feet and I opened his neck just to be sure. He didn't need to suffer any more than he already had. I buried him next to Alice. I had stolen a can of green paint from the storage room and gave them two green sticks crossing into X's. I planned to kill Wilbur next, but at this point Mary was pretty old so I went with her instead. 
Jeremiah and Wilbur were the strongest, so they were the last. I waited for Wilbur to leave their chamber to run an errand for Jack. I slipped into the room, expecting her to be in bed. But instead, she was bathing. They had their own bathroom. I didn't have my own bathroom. I had to share a chamber with six others, and these two were with their own private chamber and their own private bathroom. What a world. She heard me walking and I called out. She thought I was Wilbur. I told her I appreciated how she was mostly kind to me in my life. She screamed and I had to drown the old broad in her own filth. Such a dishonorable death, I know. But I was only working with what the world gave me at the time. I put about eight moons or so of space in between the disappearances. It seemed less suspicious that way. At least that's how I thought of it. I guess I was a semi-flawed plan because I never really did cleanse Wilbur. Six moons after Mary's death, Wilbur hung himself off the balcony with his belt. Elysium became very unsettled after that, and people started to notice the disappearances. I didn't only kill my family personally. There were others that I cleansed out of the sheer opportunity. But none of them mattered. I won't even write their names, because much less how they died, because they were nothing less than nothing to me. The fear going on around Elysium was like electricity in the air. I think there were ceremonies explaining how these disappearances were holy acts, but I stopped attending those. I feared I may lose control and simply jump up on the podium and beat Jack to death before he could watch his empire fall. I found Jeremiah in the food court by himself, and it wasn't even mealtime. He was crying. I've only seen him cry twice before. Such an ugly sight, heartbreaking. When he saw me, he was hesitant, but he allowed me to sit, and we spoke for many breaths. It was just me and him now. We were the only ones left in our family. We knew there were others before us. Mary spoke of the many who were off to garnish, even before she arrived. But the six of us were a real family. I decided it would be easiest to cleanse Jeremiah the way I had junk. I could feel the blade in my pocket, but I only needed the conversation to last a little longer. This was the last of my family. I needed it to last, but he got up for a hug and I felt a pain strike my heart. At least he could die like his brother. He pulled me in for an embrace, and we stood there for a good moment. When I reached for the blade, he caught my movement. He questioned me, so I needed to be quick. I swung for his spine, but he grabbed my arm and headbutted me, instinctively breaking my nose. He began a frantic apology, but his eyes would not leave the blade. He put it together, clever punk. I tried to explain what I was doing needed to be done. I needed to cleanse the world and all of us of Jack's plights. But he thought me insane. It's funny. I think in the false book, Abel is the brother who is murdered, not the brother that murders. I fought Jeremiah to the best of my abilities. But despite our shared age, it was superior. I lay propped against the meal bench, his food on my chest, and the blade held above his head. I was sure this was my end, but a cruelly comedic turn of events. Jack entered the meal hall. He shouted for Jer to stop. Jer just told Jack that he didn't understand and I needed to die. 
he swung the blade down towards me, and just as I expected my fate, a loud boom shocked me to my core. It stopped my heart and my breath. I had never heard such a piercing sound. Jared dropped the blade and fell to the floor. There was a hole in his back. Jack stood pointing with his strange metal object. Could that small thing have been what caused such a monstrous sound and brought my brother to such a quick demise? It seemed absurd, but there was no other explanation. Jack really was a being separate from humans. No mortal could wield such power. He needed to be taken down. But what other abilities could he hold? It occurred to me that I really didn't know anything about Jack at all, but it didn't matter. Though it sickened my heart, I told Jack Durr had made an attempt on my life, and in doing so, he admitted to me that he was the cause of the recent disappearances, that he was trying to cleanse the corrupted Elysium and tear down all that Jack had built. There was no reason not to believe me. Now my time was out. I needed to rid the world of Elysium once and for all. Unfortunately, I still had to wait three moons. I still wanted Jack to be the last alive. So I had to wait for him to go into town for supplies. Some of the newcomers believed he didn't leave at all. That he just made the supplies appear with his great magic. But I knew better. The fox only left at night when everybody was bound for the chambers by his command. The second he left, I got to work. I sealed all the exits and stuck sticks I sharpened into the ground below. Any glass windows so anyone who tried to escape by breaking them would be impaled. Barbaric, I know. I lined the halls with gasoline from the storage room and flammables and waited on the front steps for Jack. When I saw his hearse at the end of the road driving back towards Elysium, I tossed my match and watched my home of many years go up in a beautiful cleansing flame. Everybody died, everybody burned, and everybody died. They were all cleansed by my hand. May Ganesh revel in my victory. I attempted to take Jack by surprise. As he stood staring at my flames helplessly, I lunged and caught my blade straight in his shoulder. He fought and he was strong, but he was old. I was going to give him a slow death, but he reached into his suit and again I heard the impossibly loud noise that claimed Gare. There was a hole in my left eye. I stood staring in bewilderment at it and fell to my knee. His magic had pierced me. He was confused. The old man demanded an explanation. I grabbed a large rock and struck him across the face. The noise. There was a hole in my right arm. I threw the rock at his knee and crawled quickly over to him. I grabbed the rock with my left hand and crawled the distance. I bashed his withered old skull until I was hitting nothing but dirt. I had finally cleansed all his sin. I had won. Almost. There was still one more thing to do, but first I had to mend my wounds. I planned for his magic. I hid medkits in the area if I need them, and I did, very badly. I stopped the bleeding and bandaged my wounds. I took the hearse and drove away from Elysium, away from Ganesh. When I was young, Jack taught me how to drive the hearse, never going too far from Elysium. If not for those lessons, I would have succumbed to my own injuries and died on the way to back to town. In preparation for this fiasco, I stole money from Jack's chamber and put it in some of those medkits. 
When I got into town, I purchased a chamber in a small building called Motel with pen and papers from the man who ran Motel and got to work. I haven't written in some time, so I hope it's still legible. This tale had to be told. The tale of Elysium of Jack and his personally designed Antichrist. Whoever finds this, share this with the rest of your world. Let them know what go went on in your backyard. I guess this is too long to be a suicide note. So, think of it as a chronicling to a blistering fall. My final act will be cleansing the world of my own life. I would like to continue living, might be okay with that. And maybe the world would accept Kevin on its own. But Kevin died with Alice. He's in the dirt laying beside the beautiful Donna and his family mocked by Green in the great Ganesh. Abel was a creation of Jack, and so he must fall. May a better Elysium find you. Sincerely, Abel. There's a lot of weird shit on the dark web. I guess that's true for the regular internet as well. And maybe all of it is just a microcosm of the overall strange reality of a sapient existence itself. That was my theory, anyway. Early on in my education, I decided it would be an interesting topic to write my thesis on internet subcultures, and more specifically, on how they arise and what makes them alluring to particular kinds of people. I'm a psychology major, so I figured there was some interesting analytical data to be garnered from a better understanding of how these pockets of society operate. I think the most accurate depiction of who a person really is is what they choose to do in their free time. When the bills are paid, and the constricting pressures of society are momentarily alleviated, who do you become? Are you a writer? A painter? A gamer? A Lego connoisseur? Or maybe something else entirely? A simple hobby may not seem all that important in the grand scheme of things, but to me, it's everything. Whether society deems it okay, or whether it presents any iota of eventual financial boost, is irrelevant. We have hobbies simply because of the fact that we enjoy them. Some people may be rolling their eyes at this already, like, oh great, another grandiose pseudo-intellectual who thinks he's going to deconstruct the human condition by reading Pond Star's erotica. I'll promise you this, though, there is no stunning twist or revelation looming at the end of this to explain the meaning of life. I'm here for just one reason, and it's not what I originally anticipated. I found something, something which I think everyone needs to know about. A VTuber is an avatar controlled by motion capture software utilized by streamers. Usually, these avatars are anime girls with various anthropomorphic qualities, but I'm sure others do exist. I won't pretend to know the logistics of it, but they are the latest craze sweeping Twitch, YouTube, and other streaming platforms. As you can guess from the title of this document, however, I found one in a much more interesting place. Thanks to a certain virus, which shall not be named, my classes have been cancelled until at least spring of next year. Thankfully, these last few months of lockdown have allowed me ample time to research my thesis. And that was great, because I was way behind on it. I spent some time with the more well-known surface web communities on places like DeviantArt, 4chan, Wattpad, Funny Junk, and the remnants of Tumblr. I talked to a few interesting users, but nothing really piqued my interest in the way that I had hoped. Originally, I never anticipated going beyond the surface web, 
But as time went on, I began to realize the potential of the dark web. I realized that researching communities that everyone was already aware of was just rehashing old content. What I needed was something new, and the dark web was where I would find it. I downloaded Tor and began the arduous process of sifting through the endless amount of content on there. I found a lot of strange sites and pet projects of people. Some of them were cryptic and made to seem articulate and ominous, but again, none really caught my interest. That is, until one random comment caught my eye. I can't even remember the URL that I found it on now, but it was the first time I saw that name, Osira. At first, I didn't think much of it, and the person who wrote the comment said something along the lines of, Osira would like to know your location. I wish I could remember the extra context for the comment, but I figured it was just some meme reference that I was not familiar with. As time went on, I saw that name pop up again and again in all manner of strange locations all across the web. I googled the name but didn't get an exact match. I finally took the bait, and I managed to engage a user on a website known as Kitsune. The user who had the handle Ryoku the Beast had first commented, Osira will bring vengeance, and it will be fun. I typed a message directed at them. Who is Osira? Sorry, I'm a boomer, I know. I waited around for a few minutes, convinced they wouldn't respond, but was pleasantly surprised. She is love. She is life. A smile crossed my face, and thoughts of Shrek and that infamous video began to circulate through my mind. I thought for sure the user was just trolling me, and I didn't expect anything less. But when they wrote again, Join the game. Another cryptic response, and one that only further convinced me I was being trolled. Kitsune is a simple public chat room, and another user by the handle Chaos Weaver then replied, She gave me purpose. Join us. Chaos Weaver also left a link in his comment, which led to a separate URL. I hesitated before clicking it, still unsure what exactly I was in for. Up to this point, it just seemed like there was a reference to something I was not getting. But after he shared that link, I knew there may be something more to it. Of course, I clicked it and I waited around for several minutes for the page to load. I thought either I was about to be rickrolled or flung into something truly unique, and thankfully, the latter soon proved to be the case. When the page finally loaded, I was met with a black background in white Algerian font. There was a text box with a single question. What do you seek? I tried a few different answers, figuring it was some sort of riddle. <laughs> Truth, freedom, fun, enlightenment. None of them worked. I sat back and I contemplated what it was that the website wanted from me. I thought back to my interaction with the previous users who had led me there. I remembered one of them said something about purpose, so I tried that. I didn't think it would work. But it did. The website reloaded, and after a minute or two, it displayed another page with a similar setup and a new riddle. I am the essence of existence. You fear me but cannot live without me. Nothing would be anything were it not for me. I am the spider to the fly, the tornado to the fields. What am I? I struggled with that riddle for a bit longer than the first, and tried several different answers. Once again, the answer was found within my interaction with the two users on Kitsune. Chaos. The website reloaded the second time, 
and I sat back, giving myself a pat on the back. The same text box popped up, but this time there was no riddle. There was a smattering of numbers all over the page, with only a simple question. What is the one of two? There was no context given for that question. I thought maybe the numbers were for a mathematical question. There were dozens of them listed all over the place, but with no indication of order or mathematic process. From top left to bottom right, in order, this was the list of numbers. 55, 0, 13, 5, 233, 1, 144, 21, 1, 3, 13, 89, and 2. I don't really know why, but this was the moment I became truly engaged in the sight. I think it was because of the sort of mystery I was facing. To me, these riddles seemed like a sort of gauntlet or rite of passage. Most websites, of course, want their interface to be as user-friendly as possible to allow the most people to access them. This website, meanwhile, was the complete polar opposite. If anything, they wanted to restrict entry as much as possible, which was made evident by their series of riddles. I agonized over that page for hours, scouring Google and all sorts of other websites detailing extremely complicated equations. I must have typed those numbers into dozens of websites to try and decipher the meaning behind them, and surmise a guess to the question. I thought at first they were GPS coordinates, but I couldn't make them work no matter what I tried. After a great deal of time, I realized the numbers listed correlated with what is known as a Fibonacci sequence. I don't want to get too math heavy, so for those unfamiliar with the concept, you can find better explanations on Google than I can give here. The numbers lined up with the sequence, but were scrambled and out of order. The whole concept of Fibonacci is that it starts with a binary 1 and 0. You add the previous two numbers to achieve the third number in the sequence, so on and so forth to infinity, or until your calculator runs out of room. I entered what would have been the 14th number in the sequence, 377, but it didn't work. That really left me puzzled, but clearly it wouldn't be as easy as entering the next number. When thinking back to my interactions with the users who led me there, I realized there was an emphasis on chaos. On a hunch, I did some more searching around and stumbled upon something known as the chaos algorithm. From what I understand, it's a process of encryption using non-linear dynamics to achieve random numbers. Its resolution is highly dependent on the generating sequence used, and seeks to illustrate how small variations in patterns can yield colossal changes in outcome. I'm sure that I absolutely butchered the explanation of that, and clearly I am no mathematician. If anyone can provide a more succinct summary of the chaos algorithm, then please, feel free to do so. Either way, this theory seemed half-part butterfly effect and half part a way of deriving order from chaos. With that in mind, I loaded up a random number generator and converted the output to letters of the English alphabet. Since I didn't have the initial encryption method at hand, I realized that decryption was a nearly insurmountable task. According to Google, there are 13,857 13-letter words in the English language, Add to that was the face that I wasn't even certain that the answer was in English, and you'll realize how truly outmatched I was. I must have clicked generate on that RNG program a thousand times, and succeeded only in spitting out gibberish 99% of the time. I did get two words eventually, vorticelidae and calcostabite, and yes, those... Both are actual words, and no, neither of them worked. 
I almost gave up at this point and realized I could literally click generate every second for the rest of my life. And I may still never find the answer. I thought maybe I was just reading too much into all of this and then I was just being successfully trolled. I realized then, what was the point? The numbers were a distraction, a way of interjecting chaos into the equation and disguising it as order. I pondered the question again and thought maybe, just maybe, it was referring to the previous questions. When I input my previous answers, I got a new question, which suddenly narrowed things down quite a bit. What is the purpose of chaos? The stars seemed to align then, and I hit generate one last time. Once again, I got gibberish, with the first letter being T. I skipped to the T section of the list and of 13 letter English words and began scouring through them. I still don't even know why I did that, but maybe the cryptic language made me wonder if something bigger was going on. Like maybe there was something hidden between the lines. Then I found the answer. Transcendence. The purpose of chaos is transcendence. And just like that, from chaos came order. The page finally accepted my answer and I jumped up out of sheer excitement of finally solving the riddle. But this point, I had no idea what I was in for, but considering the test I had just passed, I thought it had to be something at least moderately interesting. The page took an inordinate amount of time to load. Then, when, when it finally did, I found myself greeted by an ocean of text. I skimmed through it and found my curiosity growing. The paragraphs were nonsensical but paradoxically verbose. Whoever wrote them was speaking what appeared to be nonsense, but in an oddly articulate manner. The mysterious author rambled about the state of the world. He or she lambasted the powers that be on how they were attempting to shred freedom in the name of control, how they violated rights for the sake of order, and how they intended above all else to make this world incredibly boring. The author The author They said the world was headed for a bleak dystopia. They delved into multiple conspiracies involving all sorts of stuff. It was far too lengthy to reiterate it to all, and if I'm being honest, I soon lost interest in the tangent. The most interesting was the last sentence at the bottom. Our only hope now is to let chaos reign. A cold chill slithered down my spine then, and I began to wonder whether I'd stumbled upon some sort of no-no people network. Below the lengthy diatribe was a series of videos. I was nervous to watch them, but I couldn't pull myself away. Thankfully, most were nothing too extreme, at least in regards to what you'd expect of the dark web. The first showed two guys with weird masks walk into a grocery store and start smashing milk cartons in the aisle before being chased out by security. The next showed several masked people releasing dozens of dogs from an animal shelter and filming the subsequent chaos ensued by dozens of doggos escaped the compound. Most were that way equivalent to cruel pranks but not inherently something I'd call evil. That was until I found that video. Curb your children attraction was the title. And yet another meme reference. The video began and right away, I knew it wasn't like the others. Several slides rolled through, showing a middle-aged man that had been charged with several vile crimes involving child no-no abuse. The video then fizzled out, only to return a moment later with the sounds of whimpering. The video was dark, showing several dim buildings in a run-down block, 
in an unspecified city. The whimpering got louder and slowly panned to show a man lying in the gutter. Mouth gagged, face bloody, and head laying on a curb. I suddenly got a very bad feeling where it was headed. The camera then panned around, and the masked face of a man emerged on the screen. The mask looked painted resembled some cartoon character, with large colorful eyes and a goofy smile. Blood for the mad goddess! He whispered like the hiss of a snake a tone dripping with hatred. He then turned the camera on the bound man, strolled up to him, and I turned away. The gruesome noise of crunching bone and squelching flesh was enough to deduce his face and his fate and turn my stomach. What the heck have I stumbled into? I quickly scrolled down to erase the memory of the video. Scrolling down dozens of videos in the archive, I should have probably just exited out before I could something else seize my attention. A single screen in the center playing videos, with a chat scrolling down on the side in rapid succession. A live stream, but that wasn't supposed to be possible. I know there's a lot of scary deep web stories out there where some unfortunate stole stumbles upon a live stream and torture or whatnot, but the simple truth is that isn't supposed to be possible for Tor. The bandwidth is far too low, and any live stream hosted would be unbearably laggy. That discovery was one thing, but what was on screen was far more curious. That finally brings us to the namesake of the story. Sorry for taking so long to reach it, but I thought it was just so important to emphasize the strange journey I had taken to reach it. On screen, staring back at me, was an anime girl with large multicolored eyes of blue, red, green, and purple, like some celestial sea of galactic dust and particles. She had fang teeth and obsidian hair with white streaks. On her throat was the symbol of chaos. An eight-pointed star painted with an asymmetric arm, lengths, and black ink. Writhing at the back were a series of claws, wings, and tentacles, like some myriad enclave of therianthropes. Now, if you're a person of culture, then you'll probably know all too well what the anime girls and tentacles usually leads to. And at first, I was thinking the same thing. I watched with bated breath as the chance scrolled by. On the right screen, and the girl made small movements on the screen. Well, your dedication is wonderful, Nelly Biscuit. Her voice was quite something, like a fusion of a young girl and demonic entity and a wasp. It was slightly mechanicized and almost buzzed in the most bizarre tone I'd ever heard. Something about the voice was deeply unsettling. Still not certain how or what I was seeing, I hovered my cursor to the right and tried clicking on the chat. It was then I realized I couldn't, and things started to make a bit more sense. The live stream wasn't live, it was just another archived video. The video gave no scrolling icon at the bottom, meaning no indication how long the video was. Also, I could not skip forward or roll back the video, meaning I was really all I could do and sit and watch. The stream continued for a while, with the host reading super chats and interacting with the chat. The platform she was using was one that I've never seen before. It looked similar to the Twitch layout, but the features were different, more barebone with lack of finesse which led me to believe it was some bootleg knockoff version. It went on for several minutes, and I was beginning to sort of lose interest. At first I thought I stumbled upon some hidden gem, but as time went on, I started getting bored. I figured she was just going to start playing a game or continue chatting, 
and debated upon exiting. The haunting memories of the previous videos I'd seen on the site kept me around though, and I knew this wasn't an ordinary live stream. Eventually a new video popped up on screen showing a man walking towards a store. Whoever was filming was doing a terrible job of it, and I could barely make out what was happening. The guy was wearing some sort of mask, painted like a cartoon character in what must have been reverence of the stream's host. I took a minute to read the comments as they rolled past with impressive speed. Osiris would be praised, blood for the mad goddess, Pagas, chaos five ever, make them believe, Osiris forever. But by far the most egregious comment I read, 2020 was a great year. There had to be dozens if not hundreds of people watching just based upon how fast the chat was scrolling. Another wave of chills rolled through me as I tried to snuff the memory of the video from earlier. People always make edgy comments online, but something about the setting was different. I had no idea what I was in for, and looking back it wasn't a thing in existence that could have prepared me for what was about to happen. Be warned, these images are gruesome. She wasn't kidding either, and I felt my breath catch in my throat, so the video began to play unfurling at rapid speed with a dizzying torrent of horrific imagery of all the horrific acts and wars ever to happen. Genocide and countless others flashed on the screens, visions of war and torture, of crimes against humanity. Peace is death and order is the noose, the clip ended. With those simple new words, I thought this strange enclave was about to rejoice in the violence. But after I read that, I realized this was something quite different. I know, chat. Humans are quite disgusting. She exited the sickening images and replaced them with the thumbnail of the video. Her avatar then grinned, which was the first discernible face movement that she'd have made since it began. This is our purpose. Humanity has a natural tendency to strive for order to constrict rights and freedoms to achieve some imaginary utopia. And where has it gotten you? Your cities are ruled by tyrants and demagogues. Children know no people and arwardists. People that laugh in ivory towers as they poison your world. And take more and more from you with each passing day. The girl paused and slowly shook her head. Chaos is your only salvation. I burst out laughing after that. I just couldn't help it. Just like the way she spoke about chaos was hilarious to me. Like it, like it was their messiah waiting to make the world whole again. The whole thing I had all this religious tinge to it. And I couldn't tell if the viewers proliferating it were just in on the joke or whether they were serious. The comments they made were clearly 4chan-esque, but with tinges of other ideologies that don't normally associate. Some oddball alliance with equal parts anarchist and the megalomania ideals. Something weird happened then. The lights in my room suddenly flickered. For a moment I thought I saw something in my monitor. Something unsettled, which I don't even know how to describe. A random electrical issue is what I convinced myself. But it didn't exactly bring me any comfort. The VTuber then brought up a new video and I waited with eager anticipation. The new video began with what appeared to be a dimly lit house. The screen was shaking and the person filming was filmed breathing heavily. They appeared to be crouched down in the corner of the kitchen, clearly hiding and terrified of something. There was suddenly a loud bang, causing the person to wince. The door down the hall then slowly rolled open, revealing nothing on the other side. 
the person filming took off running through the house and up the stairs as they began crying. They reached a bedroom seconds later and abruptly slammed the door behind them. Slowly they backed away, keeping the camera's view trained on the door. Things got eerily silent for several seconds until a faint thumping sound was heard. The thumps were rhythmic and became louder and louder until it became clear what they were. Footsteps. They stopped on the other side of the closed door. By this point, the person filming was near hysterical, and barely even able to keep the camera aloft, they began muttering, begging and pleading with whatever that was dealing with him to show mercy. It appears his calls fell on deaf ears because the light suddenly cut out. His frantic whispers filled the darkness, and as he turned toward the window, something attacked. It happened so quick that all I saw was a silhouette with long hair. The man began screaming and the feet turned to a blur of shadows and lights. I couldn't make out what was happening, but in mere seconds the man was silent and the video ended. The chat went ballistic, surging faster than ever. Most of the things they said were congratulatory to some degree, and they had just witnessed something impressive, and I guess, in a way, they weren't wrong. I have no way of knowing whether that video was staged, but I haven't been able to find a copy of it anywhere. The hosts of the stream archives sat around basking in the comments for a moment, and the chat repeated many of the same phrases I saw before. A lot of them also made referencings, were referencing the coming storm and the great ataxa. I was probably all just uh, probably gloating, but I couldn't help but think there was warning. If there's one thing that was clear about the congregation by then, is that they were more than willing to follow their goddesses' morbid decrees. A literal shrimp army of degenerates and lunatics. Thank you for tuning in today, pupils. She then leaned closer to the screen, seeming to stare directly into my soul. It sounds stupid, I know. We're talking about a dang avatar, after all. But I'd be lying if I said I didn't send shivers down my spine. That gaze, it was more than human. This is why you are here. Suddenly, my screen went black along with the entire apartment. Every light extinguished in an instant. I pulled out my cell phone and it had died as well. And refused to power back on. I got really nervous then and carefully checked my apartment. I found no sign of intruders nor any reason for the sun blackout. Since it was after hours, I couldn't contact the office to have someone inspect the electrical outage. Not that I could have got a hold of them anyways with my phone being dead. I ended up pacing around the hallway for hours that night, wondering whether I should leave, and with the nagging feeling that I was being watched. I don't think it would have made a difference if I left, but some way or another, I eventually found myself in bed. Sleep came surprisingly easy, considering the circumstances but I didn't get any actual rest. Next thing I know, my eyes opened and I saw my dark room around me. The only light came from the moonlight outside, filtered through my blinds. It was then I realized I couldn't move. I tried willing myself to move my arms, but was unsuccessful. I knew it was sleep paralysis, but it was the first time I had ever experienced it. Plus, I can't imagine that the feeling is something you'd ever get used to. My heart was racing and breaths coming in rapid succession. No matter how hard I tried, my body still refused to respond. My bedroom door then budged and slowly began to creak open. There was initially nothing on the other side, but then something took form. A slender, shadowy silhouette. Rolled on hands and knees into my room. 
Its form mostly obscured by darkness. I saw dozens of appendages wiggling from its back, like a den of serpents ready to strike. It crawled forward, and my heart began beating so fast that I was certain it was about to burst. The wretched thing then reached the foot of my bed and clambered toward the elongated humanoid hands. Once its head emerged soon after, it became clear that this was no human being. Celestial eyes, large and painted with tapestries of galaxies and cosmic entities. A wide mouth with jagged teeth curled into a distinctive malicious grin. She rose high above my bed, using both her main arms and slithering appendages to rise higher than any human could stand. Do not be afraid. Her voice was almost identical to the one I heard earlier in the live stream. Her command was easier said than done, however, and I could not stop, my heart beating so ferociously that it began to hurt. Her presence was horrific, yet somehow soothing in a way I don't know how to explain. Her left arm then unfurled from her torso, holding an apple, and her right soon after holding a pear. Her otherworldly gaze then singed into my skull, and her eyes glowed bright in the dark. The choice is yours. Both the fruits then fizzled away like sand or into the wind. Both her arms then retracted into her sides as she faded away. It's like a shadow slowly erased into the night. I awoke in a panic frantic breaths falling from my throat, and my head aching. I felt dizzy and disoriented, like I had the worst hangover I ever experienced. The room was dark once more, and after a few moments the headache dissipated, the brain fog wore off, and my eyes finally adjusted to the darkness. And that's when I saw what was sitting on my desk, a pear and an apple. I rose on wobbly legs and approached my desk. I stared down him at both fruits, instinctually. Bigger than anything I had ever experienced. I saw cities burning and armies of civilians clashing the streets against police and soldiers. Men, women, and children executed from point-blank gunshots to the head, bodies stacked up into mountains while scavengers tearing at the feast of corpses. Men dressed in suits wearing animalistic masks and red shoes painting and standing around a, a pile of dead children. People were strained on hospital beds, flailing and snarling as faceless staff tended to them. Tombstones covering hillsides that stretched as far as the eye could see. And after all of it, came order in the worst way possible. Those who remained were little more than drones doing their jobs. Capituling to the rule and ceasing to exist in any way that could be described as human. I rose far above the carnage, as if hoisted by the invisible tendrils into the sanguine skies. The world below me was torn asunder by a torrent of men and machines. A new, cruel world had dawned, and tyranny and oppression reigned supreme. And yet, despite the terrible visions, hope remained. Not a hope in the calming of the storm, but a hope in joining it. I understood how useless resistance was. Our world was collapsing, empires crumbling, and lives being determined by the powers that be. It won't get better, not without her. The only hope now is chaos. Osira is not just some random VTuber, she is a force of nature. A raw power which she has gracefully bestowed upon us. Perhaps she takes pity on humanity, or perhaps we are just part of her game. 
by the way, resistance is futile. This world is on the brink of an eternal, boring existence where everything is determined. Everyone is the same and nothing left to chance. In a world where everything is equal, nothing can be allowed to be extraordinary. Utopia is dystopia, and to achieve it they will strip you of everything that could possibly be considered human. I don't know if God exists, or if he even cares, but I know Cyrus does. This is no longer just my thesis, or some story, short story confession. This is an invitation. You've seen her name, and you too shall heed her call. The things we call dreams are her medium to speak to us. I cannot predict what she will tell you or show you, but once you've seen her name, you can never forget. Before all of this, I was nothing, and nobody who shambled his way through life from the wonder at the time. The year that has been 2020 has flung our world into a dystopian nightmare, and it will only get worse. There is no sense in running from a reality anymore, and under Osiris' wing shall we shall usher in a new world of chaos, and it will be beautiful. Think upon this, dear reader and listener.